Good evening and welcome to everyone. Welcome to our 12th annual um, Emile Noel State of the Union, State of the European Union um, lecture. And as some of you will know, this is an annual lecture held under the auspices of the Jean Money Centre, where we invite um, a distinguished figure from the European Union, sometimes a political figure, sometimes a judicial figure, um, to speak to us on the state of the European Union. And some years ago, this would have been a very maybe legal matter or something on refined issues of the latest internal market developments. But in recent years, the state of the European Union has become um, a much uh, bigger uh, political question. And uh, no longer do we say to people, um, you know, you won't know about the EU or the media doesn't report on the EU. Um, now we have judgments of the European Court of Justice on the front page of the New York Times, as well as the Daily Mail. We spoke earlier today with our guest speaker about the uh, uh, colourful reporting by the British media of the judgments of the European Court of Justice. Um, but it seems particularly fitting, I think, this year that we have not just um, a judge um, from the European Court of Justice, but also the British judge um, from the European Court of Justice, because amongst the many crises facing um, the EU today, probably one of the saddest uh, for those of us who have been involved with and uh, working on the EU for many years, for many decades, is the fact that the UK has given notice of its intention to leave um, the EU. So that raises many interesting questions and uh, difficult questions for the EU, for the UK, for the court, for the commission, for um, all of those, for us as academics. Um, so we're really delighted um, to have um, Advocate General Sharpston here with us tonight. Um, so in addition to it being a very uh, timely moment to have the British Advocate General from the court, she's also uh, a wonderful um, speaker to have for many other reasons. She's had uh, a triply distinguished career as an academic, um, as a barrister in the UK, a practitioner of law, and since uh, 2006 as an Advocate General, a judicial member of the European Court of Justice. Um, she uh, did her undergraduate and um, law studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, she subsequently uh, taught for some years at University College uh, London in European Union law and became later a fellow of King's College in Cambridge, of which she's still um, a fellow. And she also practiced at the bar in um, London and became a co-head of her chambers um, at the time before she went to, or at least, no, not before, but at, uh, in, in between, she spent um, some years in the cabinet of an earlier and very uh, distinguished and influential British Advocate General at the court, Advocate General Gordon Slynn. Um, and again, it's worth noting that Britain has had three uh, Advocates General of really great distinction on the court. Um, Advocate General Gordon Slynn, uh, Sir Francis Jacobs, and now um, Eleanor Sharpston. And you know, part of the sorrow many of us feel at the idea of the UK leaving the EU, including the, um, losing the, its judicial members and its advocates general on the court, is the profound influence they've had um, on the working of the court, on its practice, as well as on its jurisprudence. Um, and I think that's something that's very evident still in the opinions of Advocate General Sharpston. I think probably everyone here tonight, maybe not everyone, but most of you will know what the role of an Advocate General is, that it's a little different from the role of a, a judge on the court and that the Advocate General is an advisor to the court trying to suggest the best path to the court of the different options that may be um, available. And um, we spoke about this earlier today, but I think sometimes the Advocate General can play the role of the conscience of the court. And I think Advocate General Sharpston has done that in a number of key opinions, which any student of EU law will know well. The Ruiz Zambrano judgment on citizenship being one. Very recently, um, the Bougnau uh, judgment on the um, headscarf in France um, uh, is another one. And she gave a very uh, important judgment recently also on um, the trading powers of the EU and the extent to which they're shared with the member states in the case of the Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Those are just three. There are many others um, that could be mentioned. So it's a great pleasure to welcome here um, to uh, introduce her to you and to hear her thoughts on the state of the European Union. Thank you. <laughs> Professor de Berke, thank you very much for that very warm and very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Shortly after the end of World War II, the British wartime leader, Winston Churchill, went to Zurich. And there, on the 19th of September, 1946, he made a speech at the university. Here are some extracts of what he said. I can't do a proper Churchill imitation, so you'll just <laughs> have to take the text and put his voice over the top. The first step in the recreation of the European family must be a partnership between France and Germany. In this way only can France recover the moral and cultural leadership of Europe. For there can be no revival of Europe without a spiritually great France and a spiritually great Germany. The structure of the United States of Europe will be such as to make the material strength of a single state less important. Small nations will count as much as large ones and gain their honor by a contribution to the common cause. Skip a bit. Our constant aim must be to build and fortify the United Nations organization. And under and within that world concept, we must recreate the European family in a regional structure called, it may be, the United States of Europe. And the first practical step, go on towards the idea of the union. It finishes, in this urgent work, France and Germany must take the lead together. Great Britain, the British Commonwealth of Nations, mighty America, and I trust Soviet Russia, for then indeed all would be well, must be the friends and sponsors of the new Europe, and must champion its right to live. Therefore, I say to you, let Europe arise. It is eerie. No, it is surreal. Rereading that speech in the wake of a certain vote in the United Kingdom on June the 23rd of last year and the formal triggering of Article 50 TEU by the current British Prime Minister, Theresa May, on March the 29th, so less than a week ago, and some nine months after the Brexit referendum. This is an unusual, perhaps an uncomfortably unique moment for the British Advocate General at the Court of Justice of the European Union to deliver the Noel Lecture. Well, I said that just now, I'm the British Advocate General. Indeed, you can tell that from my rather quaint accent. <laughs> but although I was nominated to do the job that I do by the United Kingdom, I was appointed by all the member states working together. I do not act for the British government, nor do I represent the United Kingdom at or before the court in which I serve. I'm an independent or member the court. I serve the rule of law in the European Union, nothing more, nothing less. And as Professor de Berke was just explaining, my job at the court as an advocate general, not a judge, requires me to write opinions, so to be opinionated. And that's what I'm going to be this afternoon. I should add that my work also necessarily means that I am in daily contact with colleagues from other member states. Obviously, they are in touch with sentiment and currents of opinion back home in their respective countries. So that gives me privileged access to what other Europeans are thinking and talking about in these uncertain times. <coughs> in the first part of my lecture, I want to look at the state of the European Union. And along the way, I may mention, I'll try to be brief about it, I may mention some current and recent cases that have formed part of my professional job. <clears throat> because working at a court, you see a cross-section of the conflicts that are preoccupying the society for whom you are working. And also, just by way of information, unlike the US Supreme Court, the court in which I serve doesn't have docket control. We don't control cases coming in and select which one we want to take. So if a case is brought before us, then unless it is technically inadmissible, we have to decide it. And it follows from that that our caseload reflects the hot issues of the day. 
Now, of course, I cannot speak about the state of the European Union in 2017 without making reference to the Brexit process. I shall try, as I do this, both to put Brexit a little bit in its historical context and to state what I perceive to be its relative importance in the wider scale of events. In doing that, I shall be speaking both of how Brexit is viewed from the UK perspective and how it is perceived by what are now variously being called the, the EU27 or the REU, which is a very horrible acronym, the remaining EU. And in that sense, what you are going to hear is a little bit like a ventriloquist's dialogue with the dummy he performs with, you know, one voice and the other voice. I'll leave you to work out which voice is closer to my own. In the second part of my lecture, I shall move on to look at some, offer some comments on trade deals. That inevitably, of course, connects to what the EU and the UK will be spending rather a lot of time on during the coming years. But, again, as Professor de Berker mentioned in the introduction, it is in part prompted by the work that I've been doing on the EU Singapore free trade agreement over the last nine months. I shall conclude by looking into my best quality crystal ball, which of course I brought with me on the flight from Luxembourg, my best quality crystal ball in order to see where we might be headed over the next ten to five to ten years. By that we, I mean we the European Union, not we the United Kingdom. It may be that Mrs. May, British Prime Minister, will lead the United Kingdom triumphantly to the promised sunlit uplands of a leading world role for a new global Britain, unhampered by tedious EU regulation. It may be that the great experiment will end in economic and or social tears. Or, as is so often the case in real life, the final outcome may perhaps be somewhere between the two. However, my oath of office means that I serve the European Union. I have been involved professionally with the European project all of my working life. My concern is therefore primarily for what the future may hold for that noble experiment in shared values, sovereignty, standards, laws among nations with differing histories, styles, and languages. So let's turn to the state of the European Union. We are now some 65 years on from the moment that the European Coal and Steel Community, the ECSC, had to be five years before the EEC. The founding fathers of the ECSC obsessed about peace. They had very good reason to do so. With the generous assistance of the USA through the Marshall Plan, they were painfully rebuilding Europe from the rubble and devastation left by the Second World War. The preamble of the ECSC goes on and on about peace, about, and I quote, peoples long divided by bloody conflicts. And I quote again, about giving direction to a future common destiny. I would say the EU project, as it is called in shorthand, has delivered on that challenge. When the Iron Curtain came down, the former communist states of Central and Eastern Europe rushed to try to join the European Union because they saw it as a beacon of democracy, of stability and prosperity. And over those 65 years since the preamble to the ECSC Treaty was penned, there have been occasional reminders for those who choose to see them that peace and stability are not achieved without effort. They cannot simply be taken for granted. The breakup of the former Yugoslavia led to bloody conflicts uncomfortably close to the EU's own borders. The present unrest in Ukraine 
coming after the Russian incursion into Crimea should also jolt us out of our comfortable complacency. And dare I say, President Trump's slightly ambivalent position on NATO has been a sharp reminder that we Europeans really do need to wake up and look after ourselves. So, what of the state of the European Union now? What's to the fore in the collective consciousness of committed and thoughtful European citizens? And what should therefore be on the minds of those who are charged with moving the European Union forward? Well, I think it would be fair to say that there is a real awareness that we live in difficult times. The liberal, tolerant values, the democratic values that most of us took for granted are under threat. We are seeing vicious assaults on our Western way of life by terrorist bodies such as Islamic State. And there is a different kind of assault, an assault by the populist press and politicians with their post-truth narratives, their alternative facts, fake news, and politics by tweet. The phenomenon is to be found not only in the United Kingdom, but also in other member states. The recent election in the Netherlands pushed back against this trend, <coughs> the vast relief of many of us. Fair Builders' anti-immigration party did not emerge with the majority. We now hold our breath to see what happens in France and in Germany. In France with the National Front, the Front National, in Germany with Action de Deutschland. Forgive me as a guest for mentioning that, but it seems that perhaps there may be a similar phenomenon to some extent to be found here in the US. <laughs> so there's that to be worried about. Then there are those who feel that in a world of relentless globalization, they have just been left behind. There seems to be less need, less reward, of the labor that they're able to offer than in the good old days. The prosperity that globalization was meant to bring has not trickled down to them as individuals. The massive profits have gone to large multinational corporations and to banks. These disgruntled voters cannot afford the wonderful consumer goods from all over the world that fill our shops and our TV screens. In the meantime, all these foreigners come into the neighborhood. Some are fellow Europeans with recognizable shared values, but others are more alien with different cultures, different traditions, different religions. Worse, our screens have been filled, our newspapers have been filled with the refugee crisis. The appalling one, appalling loss of life at sea from leaking inflatable boats filled with desperate people trying to cross the Mediterranean. The endless files of displaced persons fleeing Syria trudging over the land bridge into Europe from Turkey and up the Western Balkans route into Croatia, Slovenia, Austria and Germany. Surely someone can act to resolve this in a humane and respectful way. Preferably some other country can take them, yes. Why isn't the EU stepping in the necessary measures? And of course, the EU has always been a convenient scapegoat for the populist press and indeed for national politicians wishing to distract attention from their own wrong-headed policies and actions. Actually, for decades, politicians have tended to claim anything good that comes about as the consequence of their own brilliant political judgment and economic management, and to blame any bad news on Brussels. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Many people within the European Union are still looking to the EU to be a positive force in helping them to keep safe, to regain prosperity even, 
whilst enabling them to continue to enjoy the open border, free travel environment to which they have very happily become accustomed. Along the way, they would like the European Union to promote policies that enrich further education for their children, help these to find good jobs at the end of the education process, ensure decent and safe working conditions, look after the environment, and so on and so on. The EU and its predecessors have, after all, successfully delivered in some measure on all these aspirations in the past, along with peace and relatively high levels of prosperity. Thus, within the EU 27, there is a different impatience with the European Union from the Euroscepticism prevalent in certain parts of the United Kingdom. Here, the complaint is not that the EU is doing too much, but that it is doing too little. There are many who are in favor of the European project, but who are frustrated because, as they see it, the EU has not done enough on major issues like security, safety, sharing the burden of the refugee crisis, and promoting growth and social cohesion. <coughs> There's a new buzzword starting to do the rounds in Brussels. The term deficit in delivery, delivery deficit, has been coined to describe this growing phenomenon. And I'm just going to refer very, very briefly Cases that I have been doing at the court tend to reflect these phenomena, above all the refugee crisis, of course. A lot of those cases coming through and posing, frankly, intractable problems. Problems that arise out of the geography of Europe and of, out of the fact that when the legislation was framed, the Dublin III regulation was framed, nobody foresaw that there would be a flood of these dimensions of people seeking international protection. And you know, whatever you do with the case, it's going to be very sensitive, it's going to be very political. The problem is essentially intractable. Whatever the Advocate General says, whatever the court says in due course, the basic problem is there and has to be sorted. Second area, security listing cases involving the asset freezing of persons and organizations suspected of supporting terrorism. That's brought that itself its fair share of awkward problems, awkward challenges in terms of what justifies <coughs> listing, what justifies a renewed lift listing, and then a knock-on from that, measures to prevent the financial system being used to support terrorism or to channel proceeds of money laundering and feeds all the predictable legal problems that run with the security problem. And then again, mention was made earlier, this boundary between the other and ourselves in society, and indeed possible tensions within the multicultural, multi-faith society of today's EU, you get the hijab cases. And there again, what the two Advocates General did, my colleague, Advocate General Cocotte and myself, and then what the Grand Chamber has done in the judgments that it delivered, in a sense, whatever the court does on those is going to be subject to scrutiny. But the problem is a problem that the EU as such has to grapple with, how to have its diversity in unity, as is one of the slogans of the, of the Union. So if one was summarizing on the state of the European Union, the EU is living through a period of serious geopolitical challenge. And those charged with its governance are fully aware that as well as keeping the economic market running smoothly, they need to find new ways to regulate the flow of migrants to Europe, to tighten up security on the EU's external borders, to fight youth unemployment, and, and more generally to renew trust and confidence in the European project to make sure that the citizens understand that many of the good things that they do enjoy, whether it's 
going off to another EU member state for a party or not being ripped off by the mobile phone companies when you telephone from abroad, take just two examples, many of those good things have something to do with the European Union. There is a massive failure to communicate, and that is something that people are starting to realise that they have to address. Is the Eurozone crisis? Well, it, it's abated, but it has not necessarily gone away for good. And many accept that some reforms are needed within the EU to structures, to priorities, so as to keep the right balance between the European Union centre and its component sovereign member states. Of course, there's nothing new about that. It's a perennial issue since the foundation of the European Economic Community. So the challenges are there. The European Union is fully aware that it needs to face up to them and then there's Brexit. Where to begin on Brexit? Well, let's begin in the United Kingdom. I think in the United Kingdom, the, the wider dimensions of the European project have never really gained traction. Historically, the Euro United Kingdom, I'm thinking back in the days of the British Empire, the United Kingdom was a world trading power, and it traded goods. Its core focus has therefore traditionally been on the free movement of goods. And the UK used to belong to a trading bloc in Europe. It was called the European Free Trade Area, EFTA. At a certain moment, the UK decided that the EEC, the common market as it was called in British speak, common market was a bigger and better trading block. So the UK left EFTA and joined the EEC. And I think the UK has never been really very comfortable with the fact, because fact it is, that the other member states had a different idea about what they were doing and wanted a deeper level of integration. Although the preamble of the Treaty of Rome speaks expressly, clearly, in black and white, of, I quote, an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, close quote, the United Kingdom has never really liked that text very much. And indeed, it tried to have it deleted as part of the negotiations surrounding the Treaty of Lisbon. So at the risk of oversimplification, one, one might say that the UK has spent the 43 years of its EEC, EC, EU membership, the acronym changes, the story doesn't, of its membership being towed along rather unwillingly. Notwithstanding the many special deals that it's managed to negotiate with its partners who wanted to keep the UK contented and within the EU, I think the UK has never felt very comfortable about its membership even with the bespoke status of not being part of Schengen, not being part of the Euro, having the Protocol 36 opt out from bringing the whole justice and home affairs pillar into mainstream EU law, and there's the protocol about the Charter Protocol 21 from memory, and so on. But despite the bespoke deal, I think that the United Kingdom has never felt comfortable with the bigger European project. And Honesty also compels me to say, for the historical record here, that when communism collapsed, when the former Comicon states applied to join the EU and were told to form a, an orderly queue at the door and we'll see how you're getting on and let you in in twos and threes maybe, the United Kingdom was in the forefront of those urging the EU to take them all in as quickly as possible. And that duly happened, 10 member states, eight from the Eastern Bloc plus Cyprus plus Malta, joining on the 1st of May 2004, then Bulgaria and Romania, 1st of January 2007, and then, of course, Croatia, 1st of July 2013. Now, there were, there were very good, very sensible geopolitical reasons behind that strategy. But it did also reflect the UK's desire to widen the EU rather than deepen it. 
and now for the Brexit referendum. Lots of other people have put the equation together in the words that follow. So this is not me making a political statement. This is summarizing the received wisdom of what's happened. There was political expediency in calling a referendum for the ruling Conservative Party that was worried about losing votes to UKIP. So a pre-general election commitment was given to holding a referendum. The anticipated result of the, referend of the general election was that there would be another coalition. Had there been another coalition, it was equally anticipated that the partners in the coalition would be the Liberal Democrats, and that if so, they would block a referendum being held. The result of the general election was, however, a Conservative majority government. So a referendum had to be called. A referendum might have been designed with certain safety nets in it, like thresholds for participation and for voting to leave, like saying that all the constituent parts of the United Kingdom had to be in favour of leaving. There's also issues about who should have been voting. All of that might have been possible, but it was designed in a particular way as an advisory referendum. Then the campaigns happened, and the two campaigns were conducted as they were conducted, and I shall not comment on it. And then we had the result of the vote. I have heard this likened to the film about the perfect storm. If you get just the wrong combination of conditions, you end up with the perfect storm. It's probably worth saying as part of the background that whereas other member states have political parties that are unashamedly pro-EU as part of their campaigning platform, political parties in the English part of the UK, I do say the English part of the UK, range from essentially Eurosceptic, conservatives, to confused but mistrustful of the EU because it's part of the capitalist world. I think that possibly describes Labour at the moment. To lukewarm support, which is the Liberal Democrats. Now, north of the border in Scotland, there is strong political support for the EU. That may explain, help to explain, why Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. Not a single voting constituency in Scotland voted to leave. In Northern Ireland, that remaining part of the United Kingdom, the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement were based on the United Kingdom and Ireland both being EU member states. The present border between the South and the North is all but invisible, which in a very British pragmatic way suits both sides of the debate about a united Ireland. And even though one political party, the Unionists, supported leave, Northern Ireland, like Scotland, Northern Ireland, voted by a majority to remain in the EU. Curiously, Wales, which has received a massive amount of EU financial support, voted leave, but there are signs in the shape of a nice fat discussion paper that the Welsh government has now realised that that may conceivably not have been in Wales' best interest. However, numerically, most of the UK's population lives in England. And although the cosmopolitan capital, London, and university cities like Oxford and Cambridge naturally voted heavily in favour of Remain. England, and as such, voted to leave. I'm sure that at some stage, not one but several very learned theses will no doubt be written, seeking to analyse. What was the precise balance of factors behind the result of the Brexit referendum? Was it the influence of the Eurosceptic press? Was it a knee-jerk anti-establishment reaction? Perhaps just deep-rooted mistrust for things European? Misinformation? Ignorance? Nostalgia for the good old days of empire? Profound reasoned conviction that the UK would do better outside the EU? Who knows? What matters is that UK voters, by a majority of 52 to 48 percent, of those voting in this nominally advisory referendum voted to leave the EU and that, that has been taken as an unshakable mandate to leave. The people have spoken. Brexit means Brexit. 
say again, the mantra of Brexit means Brexit. The UK side of the story since the referendum vote. Well, within the United Kingdom, Brexit is, as far as I can tell, centre stage, almost to the exclusion of the other business of government. The focus is on delivering Brexit. An entire new government department has been created under the singularly horrible name of DEXU, Department for Exiting the EU, which is to coordinate the endeavour. Priority objectives need to be identified, negotiating strategies crafted. And people have realised that the task of disentangling EU law from domestic law is one of labyrinthine complexity. And there are real issues, too, about Scotland and or Northern Ireland. In the interests of time, I'm not going to pick them up now, but if anyone wants to ask me questions about them, as a Celt, I will be delighted to hold forth on that subject. As a part Irish woman married to a Scot, I feel that I have some degree of entitlement to speak on those two issues. But there are real issues there. And depending on how Brexit is conducted and what the UK ends up with as a deal, there may therefore be a real threat <coughs> to another union, to the union of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. Now let's go over to the EU side of the story about Brexit. About Brexit and what's the reaction to the vote, which is the ventriloquist and ventriloquist dummy. I think initially the, the reaction could be just best summarised as a shock, a surprise, maybe not so much surprise, but maybe surprise, regret, coupled with the feeling that if the UK does want to leave, then we should, we should all get on with making that happen quickly. Please, therefore, trigger Article 50 TEU. And then the months passed, and Article 50 was not triggered. And then this feeling of impatience, well, why aren't the Brits getting on with it then, gradually gave way to sort of incredulous, dawning realisation that, that actually there wasn't a plan B. That the United Kingdom had apparently uh, decided to call the referendum and as a result of the referendum decided to leave the EU without actually having an idea of what it wanted to put in in its place. It was a vote to leave, but not a vote as to where one was going. And of course, as then the months pass and people try to understand the messages that are coming out from London, this is helped by the fact that English is a very accessible language. But that has the disadvantage that if a speech is made essentially for domestic political reasons, that the same speech is being read in all the capitals of Europe and people are trying to understand what is behind the speech. And then, then there was the Lancaster House speech in which the Prime Minister set out what her purposes were. Uh, the UK press was fairly triumphalist about that. Front page of the Times the following day read, May to EU, give us fair deal or you'll be crushed. <laughs> The speech got a slightly less enthusiastic reception from, uh, for example, EU ambassadors who attended it in Lancaster House, who spoke of unnecessary and unhelpful threats. Uh, the Czech Republic Secretary of State for EU Affairs uh, took to Twitter, you see it's not just uh, an American habit, he took to Twitter to ask where is the give for all the take? And the EU Council President, Donald Tusk, lamented what he called the sad process and surrealistic times. The Prime Minister put out in that speech 12 principles and she referred back to that and to the white paper in the actual Article 50 letter. Uh, there is a persistent perception, it should be said, among an EU audience that the avowed clarity of the Prime Minister's 12 principles isn't actually clarity, it is cherry-picking by another name. And again, I should add here that uh, a number of colleagues at the court, 
and elsewhere with a sense both of history and morality have pointed out that the United Kingdom was strongly behind the massive expansion of the EU in 2004 and that they supported the additional expansions in 2007 and 2013. In so doing, say these commentators, the UK gave moral commitments to the accession states and offered apparent leadership. With Brexit, they say, the UK is turning its back on those commitments. That's something that's a little painful as a British citizen to hear. So what is the overall EU perspective towards the Brexit negotiations? Well, let me, let me quote from Guy Verhofstadt, who's the European <coughs> Parliament's Brexit negotiator. He gave a very clear and very frank summary in an article which came out in The Guardian on the 18th of January. He said this, I quote, the EU will work in a frank and open manner to help deliver a Brexit that is least harmful for all concerned. But we must be honest with each other too. The days of UK cherry picking and Europe a la carte are over. No one in Europe wants to punish either Britain or the British. I've never heard any MEP or European leader call for this in private or public. But it is an illusion to suggest the UK will be permitted to leave the EU, but then be free <coughs> to opt back into the single, the best bits of the European project. For example, by asking for zero tariffs from the single market without accepting the obligations that come with it. I hope the British people will see from the perspective of an EU taxpayer how unreasonable this would be. So in the UK, Brexit is centre stage. Is it centre stage for the European Union? I'm going to say something really shocking. I told you I was an opinionated woman. I'm going to say something <coughs> really shocking. As far as the EU is concerned, Brexit is a messy sideshow. It is not the main act on the playbill. It is an immense time-consuming distraction. It sucks time and energy and resources away from other things that are more important. And the, just as the British side of the negotiations to come have red lines, well-known red lines. Mrs. May doesn't like migration. She doesn't like the jurisdiction of my court. She really doesn't like the jurisdiction of my court. <laughs> and uh, she has doubts about the budget, and she wants to take back control. We know the British red lines. There are also red lines on the EU side of the discussion. And the red lines for the EU include what about the three million citizens from other parts of the EU who are currently in the United Kingdom. They include trying to get the British to understand that if you're not a member of the club, the deal you have is slightly less attractive than being a member of the club. And they also, they also include paying, paying the bill. I think one, could, one should probably leave it there. I'm going to freeze the film while I look briefly at the other aspect of this tale, which is, which is trade deals. I'm going to trim this because I want to leave you time for questions, questions and answers. As I indicated, I have spent a lot of time thinking about trade deals. There were some pretty basic economic realities on this. Economists, with apologies to my brother in the audience who's a professional economist and has been one all his working life. I, I also did economics at an earlier stage. And economists love the example of the factory producing widgets. A widget is a, a standard economic unit. It's something you make, right? However, unlike uh, the modern widget is not, is not simple. The modern widget uh, is probably the result of an extended chain of production that involves components that are sourced from 
different countries. And there's some sub-assembly work, and then half-assembled sub-assemblies have to cross frontiers, and possibly they go back and forth across frontiers several times before the completed widget rolls off the final production line. So you do not want to have customs and frontier checks happening at every stage when the sub-assembly goes across a frontier. You do not also want the assembly line to be brought to a halt because there's a crucial component that is held up in customs at just the wrong moment. And those, the fact that there are sub-assemblies is a real issue when you're structuring a trade deal. You also, second real issue, and again I abbreviate, you also need stability of access to the markets. So you want your widgets to be saleable in all your destination markets. So you want the same rules that you're trying to manufacture to, the same standards. Otherwise, you have to configure your widget differently depending on where you're selling it. Obviously, you don't want to be kept out of the other market by the type of very crude trade protectionism that goes by the name of quotas and or tariffs. But there are, and very importantly, there are the non-tariff barriers to trade. It's no good at all getting your widgets tariff and quota free across a frontier if they then sit in a warehouse. You need to be able to get them on the market. To get them on the market, they have to be recognized as being fully compliant with your local regulations and standards. And so you have to get a recognition of standards. Usually, by the way, there's a court involved somewhere in terms of adjudicating on disputes. Now, this is all terribly technical. It's terribly boring. It's deeply unsexy. It doesn't make any kind of a good political soundbite. But it is what international trade is about. And by the way, if we're talking classical economics, we talk about capital. We also talk about labor. Well, replace the word labor by immigration, hackles rise. And of course, unlike widgets, workers have families and children who need to go to school. But also, workers pay taxes and social security contributions. They help to fund the social provision in the home and the state. And from an EU perspective, free movement of workers, together with freedom to or establishment and freedom to provide services, is a non-negotiable non pillar with free movement of goods of the single market. The four freedoms go together. If, I, you, know, you know the British love sports, all right? Let's use a sports analogy. If everyone is playing a game of association for football, and they're playing by the rules of soccer, one player cannot be authorized to pick the ball up and run with it in his hands as if he were playing American football. I mean, it's a great game, but it's not the same as soccer. And that is a basic issue in terms of what the deal could be between the UK and the, and the EU. And I add that to judge by the, by the Singapore agreement, which is two fat <coughs> volumes that I spent ages crawling through, actually, even without access to the EU single market, some free movement of labor necessarily finds its way into some very complicated, sophisticated, elaborate, bespoke trade deal. Because often free movement rights for some categories of labor are needed in order to make the trade agreement work, in order to enable the company to set up, for example. And it is interesting that over the months since the Brexit vote, ministers in the United Kingdom has occasionally let slip how much certain sectors of the UK economy, such as the hospitality industry, uh, such as the harvesting of seasonal crops, such as fruit, such as the National Health Service, there are certain sectors that are dependent on migrant labor, and a lot of it comes from the EU. The other very unpopular thing to say about trade deals is that they're very detailed, they're very complicated, they take a long time to put together. 
If I use the EU-Singapore trade agreement as an example, and I look at what was the core period of that, so I exclude the earlier attempt to negotiate a regional Asian agreement, I exclude the period of time spent cleaning up the text and trying to make sure that all the cross-references work, so I leave those out, the negotiating time for that deal was four and a half years. And the resulting agreement consists of a preamble, 17 chapters, a protocol, and five understandings. It's a very long technical read. There was an analysis made by the Peterson Institute for International Economics of the last 20 free trade deals made by the US. That shows the average time from talks being launched to the deal being implemented was 45 months. This is not quick, and it's not something that happens even if there were parallel negotiations on exit terms for the UK and the New Deal. It's not something that very naturally fits within a period of two years. Finally, on this, and again, I, I do apologize for stressing something that, that is surely blindingly obvious, a negotiating table has two groups of negotiators sitting on opposite sides of it. How long a deal takes to do, what ends up being included, that certainly reflects the complexity of the issues that need to be discussed. By the way, the Singapore Agreement shows that services are a particularly complex and sensitive component of any trade deal. And one of the elements that's been highlighted as being a big issue are precisely banking services, financial services, the role of the City of London. Services are not done quickly or easily. I, I certainly have no intention of predicting what's going to come out as a trade deal. I'm not any more than that. I'm not going to predict. I don't wish to predict. I am British. I'm not going to predict that the UK will necessarily fail when it leaves the EU. And people who take that scenario say it will fail. The only question is what are the time lags and just how catastrophic the failure will be and which sectors of British society will be worse affected. I'm not making that prediction. It may be that the UK will succeed in reinventing itself. If it does, I doubt myself that that will be as a global power in a style reminiscent of its imperial past, because I truly believe that those days are gone and gone for good. But the UK might, like Austria, which is another former European imperial power, it might find a different international persona. It might, in certain areas, in certain contexts, wield soft power and influence. If it's really lucky, it may manage to do that without shedding Scotland and Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom, because the United Kingdom of England and Wales doesn't have quite the same ring to it, I find. But I'm not sure that the UK should assume, as so many in Westminster at the moment seem to, that the UK is bound to do better outside the EU than inside it. We're all going to have to wait and see. And what happens will turn, at least in part, on what version of the Brexit deal the UK seeks to obtain, what deal it finally gets, and also what other deals are being negotiated. So to the conclusion, and this is where I reach for that crystal ball. Does Brexit sound the death knell of the EU? Well, Will this, as Mr. Farage openly has, has wished, you know, will we manage to get the UK out and bring the whole structure down? I don't think so. I really don't. And that's, that's not what I, apart from my desire not to see the European project fail, it's also objectively, what, from what I see, I do not think that's going to happen. Is the EU going to be paralysed until the Brexit saga is over? I was afraid that would happen. And indeed, I was speaking in Birmingham a couple of months ago, and I mentioned various new ideas that had started to surface. And then I said rather sadly that it looked as though they were being put on hold 
until we were finished with Brexit. I have never in my life been happier to be wrong. Because actually the earlier discussions which had talked about having two concentric circles, the EU, outer circle, associate members, some rights and privileges, and an inner circle of full members, you know, after the initial shock of the Brexit referendum, actually it seems to have acted as a spur to reflection within the EU. And there are signs of real determination to act. On the 1st of March, the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, issued a white paper on the future of Europe. He set out five scenarios. One, carrying on. Two, nothing but the single market. Three, those who want, to do, want more, do more. Four, doing more less efficiently, or doing less more efficiently. Try and get it the right way around. I typed it wrong. That was my mistake. Doing less more efficiently. And five, doing much more together. There are early indications from four big member states, from France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, that they support Juncker's third option, namely those who want more, do more, the, the two-speed solution. As Chancellor Merkel put it at the press conference, we need to have the courage for some countries to go ahead if not everyone wants to participate. A Europe of different speeds is necessary, otherwise we will probably get stuck. That's a wonderful and very Merkel-like remark, very straight, very down to earth. I'm going unashamedly to finish by quoting from a speech that a Spanish MEP, Esteban González Pons, made in the European Parliament, the debate being held to mark the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, which was on the 25th of March of this year. It, it sounds even more wonderful in the original Spanish, but I think that you will get enough of the flavor and the passion from my translation. Europe is presently limited to the north by populism to the south by the refugees drowned in the sea, to the east by Putin's tanks, to the west by Trump's war, in the past by war, in the future by Brexit. Today, Europe is more alone than ever, but its citizens do not know. Europe is, however, for that very reason, the best solution. And we do not know how to explain that to Europe's citizens. Globalization teaches us that today Europe is inevitable, the only option. And yet Brexit teaches us also that Europe is reversible, that you can walk backwards in history, even though outside Europe it is very cold. Europe is the solution here. Brexit, I go on with the text, Brexit is the most selfish decision made since Winston Churchill saved Britain, saved Europe with the blood, sweat and tears of the English. Little footnote here, please don't forget about the Irish, Welsh and the Scots. <laughs> but it is very common to use English for British, so I think we will forgive him. Saying Brexit is the most insidious way of saying goodbye. Europe is not a market. It is the will to live together. Leaving Europe is not leaving a market. It is leaving shared dreams. We can have a common market. But if we do not have common dreams, we have nothing. Europe is the peace that came after the disaster of war. Europe is the forgiveness between French and Germans. Europe is the return to freedom of Greece, Spain, and Portugal. <coughs> Europe is the fall of the Berlin Wall. Europe is the end of communism. Europe is the welfare state. It is democracy. Europe is fundamental rights. Can we live without all this? Can we give all this up for just a market? Thank you very much.
we have 20 minutes for question and answers, and I'm sure there will be many, but I'm going to ask the first one. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the privilege of being Professor Vaughan. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you about Scotland. But I'm actually going to frame it as a technical legal question. If Scotland were to leave the United Kingdom, there would be no question that the United Kingdom remains in the European Union. There might have to be some adjustment to the number of MEPs, because that is determined by population. There might have been some adjustment to voting <coughs> rights in the Council. But there would be no question that the remaining state is the United Kingdom minus Scotland. If the reverse happens, could not Scotland be the remaining United Kingdom without England, Wales, and Northern Ireland? And we would not have to think about the renegotiation of Scotland into, but just an adjustment of its rights and duty as the United Kingdom minus England? It's <laughs> a very nice question for us, Grant. Uh, first of all, there is uh, there was an extensive uh, and there is an ongoing academic legal debate in Scotland about whether Scotland needs to reapply or whether Scotland could, as you nicely put it, uh, take over the UK slot. So it's Scotland is the United Kingdom brackets that is Scotland minus the rest close brackets. By the way, I suspect that Northern Ireland would love to join Scotland on that arrangement. Uh, the the position is certainly a defensible position. Uh, there was a document uh, produced, uh, a document called the Dalranga document, which was produced shortly, from memory, it was produced shortly after the referendum. It was only in the summer of last year uh, by Brenda Valeri, who's at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was what was being suggested was a constitutional reconfiguration in the UK such that when either Article 50 wouldn't be triggered or when Article 50 was triggered, it would be triggered but with a sort of potential carve out so that it would only be the non-Scottish and non-Irish parts of the UK that left. I think the problem or a problem now may be <coughs> precisely that Theresa May has written a letter which gives notice on behalf of everyone and also in the letter itself. And I'm just reaching for it because I don't, mostly I've not tried to commit it to memory. In the letter itself, uh, she says that the UK, from the start and throughout the discussions, we will most negotiate as one United Kingdom taking due account of the specific interests of every nation and region of the UK has been done so. And she goes on to talk about return of powers and will concentrate on what's going to be in Westminster and what should be devolved and so on. And, and it, it might be said that the trouble is that she's given notice on behalf of everyone and that in so doing, she has closed off a potential option also try and argue it the other way, but it's an addition, it's an addition handicap. Uh, I think I think it may perhaps be permitted to me to add that the the sense I have from what's happening in, in Scotland, I was in Scotland about three weeks ago, and it was like an anthill that somebody's kicked. I mean there was a real sense of concern and yeah, indignation as to how matters were progressing. Just to give a little illustration of the problem, Scotland produced, the Scottish Government produced a very thoughtful and detailed paper called Scotland's Place in Europe. And in that paper, they, they looked at the various options. They looked at what Scotland's economic needs were, the fact that Scotland actually needs inbound migration. And they looked at the various possibilities and they said, look, you know, we'd like to stay in the EU, but if we can't have that, then, well, some sort of arrangement may be after that. You know, they go through the options. And they sent that document to Westminster, and they fixed a date in the diary for the document to be discussed. Two days before that date, the Prime Minister gave the Lancaster House speech, which therefore closed off 
every element for discussion before the discussion is actually happening. And you don't have to be a, a native born Scot to, to feel that that's perhaps not a wholly appropriate way of reacting to a big discussion document from the Scottish government. <laughs> I know quite a few lawyers who would manage to get around the Theresa May letter. I think so. <laughs> uh, the floor is open. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Maria Vizdana. I am a um, uh, graduate student of Columbia Law School. I have two questions. No, no, only one is about <laughs> 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 Just one question. Okay. One question. Um, do you think the UK should have never been accepted in the European Union? Do you think that should have been the goal was right? Do you think that the UK membership into the EU? Uh, and second, do you think Brussels will make it very difficult in the negotiations process for the UK to be? To combine a single answer to what was a single question with two limbs, <laughs> <laughs> the best traditions of France, the de, de volet. <laughs> the first, the first volet, membership of the European Union is open to any European state. So on that basis, I believe the UK qualified. And, uh, but what, what political decisions are taken are outside my province, I'm a lawyer. In terms of the second question, in a sense, I don't think Brussels has to, quote, to make it difficult. At the moment, there are two different perceptions of what can be negotiated. There is the UK perception, which is, here is our shopping list, and you're going to say yes. And the letter that was written by my Prime Minister, uh, as well as speaking, I believe, seven times of a deep and special partnership, uh, also spoke of a deep and special partnership that takes in both economic and security cooperation. So the two aspects were linked. Uh, I, think, I think, again, it would be fair to say that didn't go down too much. Christine, one question, please. <laughs> one only one question. Uh, you ended with the citation, I think we all would agree here. My question is now, why does the uh, Commission with uh, this white paper on the future of Europe then so often say the aim of the European Union is that everybody profits from it, makes very much the European Union just to be a market. So I wonder how, if we sort of agree with the last citation, how the European Commission can have such a thin and that such a on a market concentrated reduced idea of the future of the European Union. I, I think that question should perhaps be directed to the European Commun Commission rather than to a, a member of the European Court. Uh, uh, and I think possibly that uh, if the compelled response was indeed trying to reverse the balance a bit by reminding people of the non-economic dimensions of the European project. Yes, Peter. So your, your final citation reminded me of uh, Basilio's famous line about Italy, that we have made Italy, now we must make European or Italians. Uh, and the same idea applies, obviously, to Europe. Uh, and in saying that Europe has a will to live together, really begs the question of how does Europe have this will to have together, or what do they have the will to do? Uh, Germans believe in, in discipline and internal devaluation. Uh, others might say that we need to figure out a way to actually have solidarity and the capacity to recycle German surpluses throughout the Union. These are fundamental, fundamental uh, political disagreements, even though at a level of generality, people could say Europeans have Europe is about a will to live together. In that regard, you've invoked the line between law and politics several times. Aren't we at the limits of the law and what we can engineer by law because something more fundamental has to occur in order to have a sustainable process of European integration over time? Yes. <laughs> and the next question was. <laughs> I think it's possible.
possible to will to live together even if as one has different projects. It's just about every marriage I know. But <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much. So I'm not going to ask you a, a question about Brexit. It's too depressing. That, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> it's too depressing. I live in Strasbourg and teach in Strasbourg, and I'm really feeling very European. So I'm going to tackle the second issue that we didn't really have much time to deal with, uh, it's trade deals. Um, and trade deals are at the moment very much criticized in, in Europe um, from people that are very European. I know because I advise some of them, uh, they're not anti-European project, but still have legitimate concerns on how they come about, about transparency, and about the content of uh, these uh, trade deals. So it's very difficult as a European at the moment to be critical about you know, these, these deals, but, but still you need to kind of look a little bit into this. And uh, so in your opinion, you were uh, on, on the Singapore uh, EU trade uh, agreement, you were not asked about the substance of this uh, agreement, but do you think uh, it is compatible with uh, the EU treaties, and by extension, uh, because we know that CETA will be presented probably for uh, submitted to the Court of Justice for uh, an advice, an opinion on its compatibility, compatibility with the treaties. By extension, will CETA be also? Um, do you think as? Um, Advocate General, that it's compatible with the EU treaties. I, I can expand I, in I more think, technical no, terms. I think you'll we'll understand. I'm not going to comment substantively on either of your questions. I didn't look at the. I, I did what I was required to do, which was to look uh, at the competence issue, whether it was EU competence or exclusive or shared competence, and answering that question led me to write the longest opinion that I've written in 11 years at the court, and yeah. it took about eight months of solid work. I had no intention of trying to answer the question whether the substance, every aspect of the substance of the Singapore trade deal <coughs> is in every, every last inch and respect compatible with the EU treaty. The court hasn't been asked that question, and I'm not going to try and answer it now. And for the same reason, I think you'll appreciate that as a serving member of the court, the very last thing I would do would be to hazard a, a speculation, because it would be nothing more than that, about what would be the outcome if and when somebody who has the entitlement to put that question to the court asks the court to deliver an opinion on the CETA deal. I can tell you one thing, this Advocate General hopes with all her heart but nobody will ask her. You <laughs> 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 might get that question. <laughs> we'll try, sir. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, so you made a lot of reference to our question that's very much an existential question. The European so, sorry, I made a lot of reference to? Oh, you made a lot of reference to a question that's very much an existential question in the European Union, which is, European integration between member states. You talked about finding the balance between national sovereignty and closer community. I, I think I made one sentence about that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and the Rome statute talks about like an ever closer union. <clears throat> so we can like look at national polling to figure out what European populations feel about closer integration and the levels of integration that have already been reached in our plan. My question is among your colleagues who work in the European Union, what are their ideas about what the role of the European Union should be? Do they want to, do they think that Brexit is maybe a call to step back? Do they see it as an opportunity to push forward without the UK maybe uh, putting the brakes? What do they believe, the, where from now do they believe the European project should go? Well, the colleagues I work with are my professional colleagues at the courts who are judges and advocates in the court. And uh, I can tell you, and I mean it very sincerely, that our job is we judge cases. We do not produce general statements about where we think Europe is going. We decide according to law the cases that are submitted to the court. That is my professional job. That's the professional job of my colleagues, and that's what we do. I'm sometimes have been asked in the UK 
questions rather along the lines of surely there's always this big federalist plot and so on, and the court is engaged in a process of power grab. These are the daily mail questions. And I, I have tended to say in answer to that, well, maybe I'm very unobservant, but in 11 years at the court, I, I confess I haven't actually come across this project. I, I have argued with colleagues as to what was the correct legal solution in the case, but the conversation has never taken place against the backdrop of, but surely, Eleanor, you remember that the project is the <laughs> following. It's never happened. <laughs> Yes, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I have a question that Ronnie alluded to in the beginning of the introduction. It's about the impact of Brexit on the court itself. So I was wondering whether you could comment, at least in general terms, about the legacy of the British Advocate Generals at the EU Court of Justice, if Brexit indeed happens, whether the contribution in terms of methodology and thinking about cases and distinguishing, distinguishing cases and having a very particular tone when writing those opinions, but that will endure and might influence other advocate generals from then up other countries, or whether you think we might go back to a more continental way of advocate generals approaching their role at the court after Brexit. I feel a little bit as though I'm assisting at my own wake here, which is slightly uncomfortable. I know that a lot is made of the distinction, the differences between the common law approach and the continental approach. I, I have to say, I know there are differences between advocates general, but I'm not sure that they're as, as explicable in as simple terms as that. Uh, and I say that partly because as an advocate general, I work with a team of four lawyers who work directly with me. And those four lawyers are Scott, a, an English barrister, so I have the same tradition as myself, uh, from the government legal service, a Greek, and a Pole. And I'm not sure that when you put that combination together and they're drafting an opinion, that what you end up is a pure common law, let's distinguish the precedent approach. At least I hope you don't end up with that. Because if that were the way that I wrote an opinion, I think it would be less useful to the court. I try and write an opinion which, notwithstanding that you may be coming at reading it from a different part of the legal universe, is still going to be helpful, is still going to clarify the issues, and you're still going to understand why I promote a particular solution over another. I think. I will speak of my predecessors, not of myself, because I, I'm not judging my own level of work and how much it's been a contribution. I think you can certainly, looking back at initially Jean-Pierre Warner, but then very much Gordon Slim and Francis Jacobs, particularly perhaps Francis because he was so long serving. I think you can detect there a distinctive contribution. And it's a contribution which comes from people who are used to giving an individual opinion and being prepared to stand up behind it rather than here is the first draft and now let's get the college together and get us to agree. So I think, I think there is perhaps an individualism to it and a sort of, if you like, a preparedness to take a first draft from, you know, from one's record on there, but then really to invest one's own individual perception of where where the law should go, why it should go. And I think it will be sad to lose that contribution. I'm thinking of Francis Jacobs' really magisterial opinion in, in UPA on Locker Standard, for example. I can't imagine that, in fact, being written by an advocate general from a different tradition. And Francis's opinion may not have been followed by the court, but then subsequently the convention and then really the Lisbon Treaty Actually, the goalpost shifted in part because of what Francis wrote, and that surely has to be that as a landmark contribution. And I'm proud that a, somebody from my own legal tradition made that contribution. We have to thank maybe special status to Ireland 
ad hoc advocate general to keep. More questions, Jenny? Uh, yes, it was kind of similar to Thomas's question, but I was wondering, in your experience, do you see that there is a difference in the way the court functions and even the way the opinions of the advocate generals and the judgments of the court um, are made according to the composition of the EU itself? Have they changed when the new countries came? Probably changed in 2007, 2013. So I was wondering if this would have an effect on the way the court functions. That's an interesting question. I think that I think that certainly there has been a change. I'm having more difficulty, if you like, in deconstructing exactly what the components are. You bring more people into the court. You bring people in who come from different different backgrounds and legal traditions, and they also have a different lived experience as citizens. So, you know, if you lived under communism and you made your way through your career and then there's the fall of communism and then you're an accession state, that does mark the way you see the world. But I think what I'm saying there is that regarding the court as a sort of homogenous unit is actually a bit misleading because each of us comes to the court with our own legal tradition behind us, certainly, but also with our personal career behind us. I know very well that the opinions that I write and the views that I form are configured by my own family history, by the fact that as a practitioner I did EU cases, but I also did quite a lot of pro bono human rights cases on the Strasbourg and by the fact that I'm an academic and a practitioner, so I have those two elements. And I, I know perfectly well that you know you could you could deconstruct what I write in, as opinions, and you could say, yeah, well, the Sharpston opinion has got these elements in it because that's Sharpston's background. And then if you were to do exactly the same analysis for my colleague, Advocate General Mengozzi, very senior Italian professor, you know, you could you could do in other words, the court is made of human beings. And there are also external factors, which I think are very important here. The court is much, much busier now than it was 20 years ago. It's much busier now than it was when I joined it. And that also puts a particular form of pressure. I, I, to take this a simple example, we used to be very, very indulgent and friendly towards member states' courts. And we spent a lot of, even if the question they asked was a bit fluffy, and even if they didn't put it very well, and even if the relevance for the EU law was a bit tangential, and even if the order for reference was pretty rubbish, we still more or less managed to work out what they were asking us about, and we would answer the question. And we're nothing like as friendly and cuddly anymore. We really aren't. You know, we now say, here are the rules. You put a new article, Article 94, into the rules of procedure. This is what an order for reference shall contain. And if it doesn't contain that, then we'll chuck it out. And that, now, I mean, that, that, that's an indication of change. Just taking up on that, I would like, if possible, to finish on this personal thing. Would you be willing to share with us what was the opinion you wrote that made you happiest, that you're most proud of, that you look back and you say, if nothing else, it was worth that, and the one that gave you most grief. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a problem because the work you've just done is always pressure in your mind. I'll tell you that actually, recent, very recently, of course, I wrote the opinion in Bale's case. And that is both is easily identifiable as an opinion which I spent a long time, I worked with David Bjork, with my Scottish lawyer, on that. And we both invested very heavily in it. And we tried to explain why it was so important to understand the balance between the right of the employers run this business and the right of an Islamic um, practicing Muslim employee to have the jab. And I was very 
I was pleased with what we wrote. I was wondering how the court was going to square the circle on two advocate general's opinions that went in different directions in two cases with fairly similar facts. And I was uncomfortable with the combination of judgments that came out because I think there is a danger that the court will be understood to have endorsed discrimination. I think, really think that's what the court meant to write. And I think you can read the judgments not as endorsing discrimination, but I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very happy with what came out. So probably I identified an opinion both that I was happy about writing and one where I wasn't too happy about exactly what, what came out at the end of it. Uh, I've, I've, I'm lucky, there were, quite, there were quite a few opinions also that I've been quite happy about. Thank you. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us.